Hi, my friends. It's David Alt, and I want to welcome you to the gathering. It is Easter morning. And as I reflect on the innumerable Easter's that I have been privileged to share with people throughout the years, um, I, I try to see what was the core message and what continues to bubble up is the idea of freedom. That what this, this time of year, what the symbology of all of this is, is freedom at its very core. And when I think about the fact that we are celebrating Passover and we are experiencing spring on this side of the earth and we have Easter today, they all have a unified message. Passover telling us the exodus uh, of the Jewish people from enslavement to freedom, Moses leading them on this particular journey of spring reminding us repeatedly that what appears to be dormant actually possesses life, the freedom of life, the unfailing nature of the cyclical return of that, which is creativity and expression and life in its most givingness. And Easter, that death in and of itself is an illusion that really what is eternal is this thing called life and that we can rest in a freedom, a freedom that um, frees us of the despair and the worry and the anxiousness of the mystery of what happens to us. These things continue to be told time and time again in so many different ways. We have all of these celebrations. We have all of these holidays. We have all of these opportunities to pivot back to these essential core truths. And yet, here's the fascinating thing. We continue to forget. Oftentimes, myself included, we will reserve our celebration and we will reserve our expressions of freedom for special occasions, for particular times of the year, like, like now. And yet, the eternality, the, the infallible nature of our freedom and our connection to those things knows no time, knows no holiday. It's just a part of the isness. And so we gather together, just like we're doing now, to find ways to continue to shake ourselves from a sleep, shaking ourselves from the, the null and the, the void of our forgetfulness and our separation. And sometimes it'll last for a little bit and we will bask in the glory of the communal, communal remembering and then we will go about our ways and we will forget again. And you know what? It's okay. It's really kind of the nature of this experience. And yet each of us finds a way not only to remind us ourselves about our inherent freedom, but to hopefully inspire and remind others to do that as well. And we realize that sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. And again, it's okay. And I, I stress this morning that it's okay because there's a greater thing happening than we realize. Yes, we feel an urgency for everybody to wake up. And yet, the more that we mature in our understanding of the principal nature of the existence of creation, we realize that eventually, on the individual journeys of all sentient beings, that they will, that we all will wake or shake ourselves up from the sleep because we cannot help but to. Because the destination for all sentient life is the same. We return, we return home, we return to the one. And who knows in what timeline and in what incarnation, at what point all of that will happen? There are schools of quantum thought <laughs> that will tell you that it already has and that we are just in a sort of cosmic replay. 
but not to get too far off topic. It is to see if now when we approach this idea of freedom, now when we celebrate Easter, now when we witness spring, now when we revere the story of Passover, that we do so not in a way to try to change other people, but to do it in a way where we soften our own fears. Did you hear that? That we, we celebrate our own Easter by softening our own fears and not so much trying to rally the troops or to win the souls, but to soften our own fears and to begin practicing living, living the freedom. So three things came to mind. So the first one is, uh, I have to tell you a little story. So when I turned 60, I took myself, thanks to some help of some friends, to a retreat. This retreat was in the woods of Massachusetts, and it was to sit at the feet of 40 indigenous elders. It was a long weekend. It was Thursday through Monday. And in that weekend, I was going to be having my birthday. And I thought, you know, this is this is where I need to be. I need to sit at the feet of wisdom and I need to rest and I need to hear and I need to remind myself because I wasn't in a good place. And I felt sad that I was going to be entering into this new decade feeling this way. And so I wanted to put myself in the presence of some wisdom to hopefully shake myself from all of the projections and the self-judgment that I was feeling. And of all of these elders and of all of these people that were available to participate with, I found myself gravitating to these two Haitian priests. And I was fascinated by their message of the ancient practice of voodoo, or as we crudely say, voodoo. But they told it in a way that mirrored mystical Christianity. And I loved it. The, the, their message. I loved their presentation. And so every time that they were speaking, no matter if it was in a meadow or in a room somewhere, I would find them and I would listen. And I spoke to one of the priests uh, a couple of times after the sessions. And he could sense that there was something weighing on me. And a couple of things happened during the course of this retreat. I isolated myself. And so I would go and I would listen, but then I, I didn't really mingle with the crowd. And I would take these long walks throughout the many acres of this retreat place. And I would turn a corner and there this Haitian priest would be. I would go and I would sit by a pond and throw stones and contemplate my life situation and what had happened. And I would turn around and there he would be. I would purposefully try to find an isolated place in the mess hall to eat my food. And he would come and he would sit next to me. And finally, I just looked at him and I said, do you have a message for me? And he said, yes, I do. And his message was, forgive all debt. Forgive all debt. And I remember not being very excited about that. I, I got chills when he said it because I knew that he had lasered in on my biggest problem. But I wanted something else because that was so direct. And he didn't waste any time in telling me that the freedom and these, I, I didn't say I'm wanting freedom, but he said to me, the freedom that you hunger for rests when you rest in availability, rest in the exposure, rest in its revelation, its reveal to you when you forgive all debt. It's no mistake that when we say the Lord's Prayer, there is a line in there that says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive those 
that we hold debt for the trespasses. It's no mistake that when we um, when we obsess in our minds about what's been taken away from us or who did what to us, whether the debts be monetary or emotional or a physical, it doesn't matter that when we when we harden ourselves or separate ourselves and hold another accountable for our freedom, what we have done is we have possessed given possession of our freedom to those individuals. And so we are blaming them. And we have created a, a debt that has been incurred because of something that they did. But when you forgive that, what happens is, is these fictitious bars, these, this fictitious imprisonment, the cages that we place ourselves in begin to dissolve. And we realize that all along, the freedom has been here. We have just self-caged, self-enclosed, self-barricaded ourselves from it. So his message of forgive all debt really hit home. As I struggled with the failed relationship as I struggled with the decisions that I had made in order to to pivot back to a freedom back to a physical healing back to um, self rediscovery that I couldn't do any of those things until I did this one seminal thing which was forgive all debt so that's number one on this sort of Easter message of a return to seeing the freedom that is already there. Number two is this, this thing that we play in. And it's a, it's kind of a, it's this caricature of confusion. The character of confusion is the part of us that goes, I just, I don't know. I just don't know. And I don't want you to confuse that with a genuine uh, desire for clarity, meaning that when some information is presented to us, we can genuinely say, I, I need clarification. What I'm hearing is this, and I'm not really quite sure that that's that I'm fully grasping. That's a sincere desire to understand more. But this confusion that's just dismissive and stagnant where we go, well, I just, I don't know, is, is an escape mechanism from, from being self-responsible for removing all of the barricades to our freedom. Because when we just kind of throw our hands up in the air in exasperation and say, I, I don't know then really what we're saying is, I don't want to know. And in a way, what that does is it takes the innate urge of freedom and it creates this sort of passive aggressive relationship with it. The very thing that we're, we're craving that wants to continue to bust through all of these layers of resistance, we're basically announcing that we're not interested that we would rather stay in a safety zone of ambiguity because that's what's familiar. That's what's familiar. And number three is that also. Number three is familiarity. Um, I was listening and reading some things from a social scientist the other day that, that his synthesis of the human condition is that no matter how much pain we are in, many, many, many of our populace will default to what's familiar. And he listed a lot of examples about the person in an abusive environment who will continue to stay in that environment, even when there are possibilities to extricate themselves from it, because the mystery of the unknown is too terrifying. And they would rather, they would rather exist in the familiarity. And yes, I know there are exceptions to that. The familiarity of someone who never leaves within a 15, 20 mile radius of where they were born 
even though there is a yearning and a longing to experience the world, they don't do that because something about that familiarity keeps them, keeps them locked into that particular thing. And yes, I understand there are exceptions to that. But when I say familiarity, I'm talking about a sort of resignation, a resignation that says something like this. I don't believe in spring because I can't see it because everything around me is dormant. Even though spring arrives faithfully, that means that the metaphor of a spring, the metaphor of an Easter, the metaphor of an exodus out of enslavement to freedom is not just stories on a page, but they are blueprints for the individual journey, if we but use them. But if I become too seduced and too immersed with familiarity, resignation, the world is simply unsafe. I, if I, if I label myself, you know, as a, as an introvert, because we love labels, I, I dismiss myself from the fluidity of I'm, I'm a little bit of everything. Why, why cast these labels? Why, why chisel them into stone? If what I am is an ever evolving instrument of Freedom, dying to be expressed. And so you see, we are constantly given nuggets, cosmic breadcrumbs of how to remind ourselves that freedom is our inherent right. But too often, we're unwilling to forgive our debts. Too often, we default to a sense of confusion, becoming comfortable and saying, I don't know. And we just throw up our hands in exasperation instead of experimenting with phrases like this. I may not know right here in this moment, but there is something inside of me that does feel that feel what happens when you say that instead of saying, I, I don't know. And then letting that be like a period after that to say, hmm, I may not understand in this moment, but something inside of me knows. And what that does then is it prepares us for a time of deep listening. It it polishes off all of our curiosity preceptors so that we can begin to be in uh, in full attention on cosmic tiptoe to see what it is that's going to reveal itself to us in order to lift that confusion, to lift that unknowing. Because the truth is, if I am a part of this one thing, then I am a part of that that knows. I am a part of it. the part that does know the part that is the bearer of the witness of the full totality of creation is in me. I'm not a drop in the ocean. I'm an ocean in the drop. And then that part that just kind of rolls over and stays in the familiar that too is prohibiting the experience of a freedom of new vistas, of new curiosities, of new exploration. And so notice what I said. I gave you three examples. I gave you forgive all debt, confusion, and familiarity. And yet still, here's the paradox. We don't have to do any of it. We don't have to do any of it. And you will still arrive home. You will still return to freedom. So what does it mean? Why do it? 
Why, why go to these lengths to explore ourselves or try to rally the troops to do it for themselves? Why do it? And I think it's because wherever we are on the spectrum, you know, it's like you going and having an, a delicious meal at a restaurant and you want everybody else to know about it. And so you tell everybody, you, you watch a great movie and it moves you to tears and you want to tell everybody. You go and you experience a moving piece of music or witness someone telling a story or teaching a lesson or uncovering something that ignites the passion within you, of course you want to share it. And that's really what it is. We, we want to share what it is that lights our fire. And it's good to. And one of the things that we have to understand is that we must share, we must be the example, we must perpetually light that fire and simply understand without attachment and expectation that everyone will arrive when they arrive. And that's it. And here's the, the last thing. That too is a form of freedom. As someone who has, you know, said, I'm a spiritual leader, I don't even know what that means. But as someone responsible or taking on a job or a role to lead people in all things spiritual, there is an entrapment in that, an expectation with that, a metric that is supposed to be met. And so without realizing it, another form of imprisonment is being expressed through the label of that because there is this measurement, there is this expectation, and there is this thing in the human experience that says all of this leadership has to look a particular way. But what I continue to learn, what I continue to uncover as an Easter message is that, yeah, we still do all of those things. But we relinquish the grip and the fear of what it is supposed to look like. And we just offer it up. And again, everyone in the position and the responsibility of those things will come to an awareness that the greatest way to teach freedom, the greatest way to offer an Easter message is to experiment it with yourself. And it is so scary at times to let go of the model and the form and the shoulds and the comparisons the battle of the bills and uh, keeping the lights on and all of the things that we are told we are supposed to do. And I, I'm just speaking from the heart right now and that you, you lead, you lead somewhere in some capacity in some circle. And is your leading shrouded, entrapped in expectation? Therein lies yet another opportunity to forgive all debt, the debt that you are placing upon yourself for the way in which something needs to be or look or do. It's time. It's time for your Easter. It's time for your reacquaintance with freedom. And it is my prayer that you take these steps, these observations, and if they are of meaning to you, that you spend a little time with them, that you apply them, that you forgive all debt, that you 
not throw your hands up in confusion and you remind yourself that there is something inside of you that does know that's ancient and old and timeless and that you don't have to be a prisoner to familiarity. Happy Easter, everyone.